Okay, in this video we're going to talk about something called the quotient group. So we need a couple setup definitions, some of which we've seen before, before we can prove our main theorem. So the first definition uh, is going to be for the set of left cosets and really just some notation. So for any subgroup H of G, so any type of subgroup, it doesn't have to be normal or anything yet, denote the set of left cosets by this thing G over H. And notice here I have, this is the set of left cosets uh, with coset representative G, and there's our subgroup H, and we're running this all over all elements of the group. And usually we say here like G by H or something like that. And now let's recall by Lagrange's theorem, we have the number of left cosets is equal to the uh, index of the subgroup. So that's just by a definition, but that's also equal to the size of the group divided by um, the size of the subgroup. And obviously this only makes sense if you have a finite group, this uh, division of numbers. Okay, good. And maybe this provides some motivation for this notation over here. Okay, another definition I want to review is that of a normal subgroup. So we say N is a normal subgroup. Our notation is this little triangle. If the left coset GN is the same thing as the right coset NG. And you know, often we'll check this uh, with an element wise calculation. We would check that G times little n times G inverse is an element of the subgroup N. And this would check this element wise. Okay, so these normal subgroups play a very important role when talking about this set of cosets, and uh, the role is really spelled out by this theorem. So if we have a normal subgroup N, then G by N, so the set of left cosets, um, and generally when this is called, uh, when this is a normal subgroup, we'll say G mod N. So G mod N forms a group and that group is known as the quotient group. So if it forms a group, we need to talk about well, the, what the operation is, and then from the operation, we can figure out what the identity is and inverses and everything like that. And so the operation is given by the following. So this coset xn times this coset yn is going to be equal to this coset x times yn. Okay, good. So we're gonna look at the proof, and what's really important uh, in this proof is showing that this operation is well defined. That's the first thing that we have to do. Um, and remember, we have to do that because these cosets may have different representatives. So cosets can be the same and have different representatives. We've got a theorem from before of equality of cosets. And so the normality of the group is what makes this operation well defined. Remember, this has to be a binary operation, and a binary operation is a function. So in order for functions to make sense, they have to be well-defined. Okay, great. So let's suppose that x1 um, n equals x2 n. So in other words, we've got a coset, um, or we've got two different coset representatives for the same coset. Um, and then also y1 n equals y2 n. Okay, great. But now, notice, let's recall that this means a lot of different things. I'll write down just maybe the uh, quickest one. This means that x1, x2 inverse is an element of n. And also, x2, x1 inverse is an element of n. And you can uh, play that around any way you want. And again, that's by a theorem that we proved earlier. And here we have y1, y2 inverse is an element of n. Okay, great. So now uh, let's see how this calculation goes. Let's take x1 n times y1 n. Okay, good. And now notice that's going to be the same thing as x1 y1 n. Okay, so now what we can do is we can multiply in here by an element of n, and we don't change the overall coset. So we'll do that. This is the same thing as x1, y1, y1 inverse, y2 n. And these, this equality happens because y1 inverse times y2 is an element of n because these cosets were the same. Okay, good. Um, and now the next thing that we can do is notice we can collapse this y1 and y2 down to the identity. So this is the same thing as x1, y2, n. 
Okay, good. Now we're going to use normality to turn this left coset into a right coset. So this is the same thing as n x1 y2. And now we're going to play the same game again and rewrite this as n times uh, x2 x1 inverse x1 y2 so we've introduced this x2 x1 inverse term and we know that these are the same right here because uh, x2 x1 inverse is going to be an element of n and we know that again from a previous theorem on equality of um, cosets but now we can take this x1 and this x1 inverse and have those cancel each other and that'll give us the right coset in x2 y2 but again that's the same thing as the left coset x2 y2 n given the fact that this is a normal subgroup um, and uh, then we can factor that thing out to x2 n y2 n and that's all we really need because here what we've shown is that it doesn't matter what we take as the coset representative we get this product is the same so we've shown that the operation inside this setup is well defined in other words we do have a binary operation now we just need to check all of the rest of the axioms for a group Okay, so now we're going to check the other axioms uh, for a group. So we'll first check uh, identity. And so uh, we'll consider E times N, in other words, the coset, which is just N itself. And notice that XN times EN, well, that's going to be exactly XEN, which is XN. So in other words, um, that does act as the identity. And then inverses, so that's uh, just as easy. So if we take XN, so the inverse of that element in the quotient group is given by the coset made up of the inverse from the actual group. So I'm not gonna check that that works as an inverse. I also won't check associativity because that is easily inherited from the group. Okay, good. So I'm gonna clean up the board and then we're gonna look at an example. Okay, so now let's look at an example. We're gonna look at the dihedral group of order six. In other words, the symmetries of an equilateral triangle. So the subgroup we're gonna consider is the cyclic subgroup generated by the rotation. So we've got a zero degree rotation, 120 and a 240 degree rotation. So generated by this R. And then this left coset SR is equal to this right coset RS. And that's actually really easy to check. And that's the only thing you need to check in order for this to be normal because this group is generated by the rotation and the rotation obviously commutes with everything in here so the left coset will be the right coset and then it's other generator is the reflection so all we need to check is that this rule is satisfied for generators Okay, great. So that means uh, that what we need to do is look at all of the cosets. In other words, the set of cosets. So let's see, D3 mod this subgroup R. So that is going to have exactly two cosets. The subgroup itself, and then the sub, oh, sorry, sorry, the coset of the reflection. And we know that there are two because the size of D3 divided by the size of this cyclic subgroup is equal to two. Great, which is the index of the subgroup or the number of cosets. Okay, great. Now what we can do is notice that this gives us an isomorphism with Z2. Um, because this is acting as the identity this is acting as the number one if you add one to itself you get two which is the identity in Z2 you're back there and if you add that to itself you get s squared and s squared is like the identity so you get back to here so uh, we could also make this with a Cayley table to see this explicitly so there's our coset R our coset SR, again R and then SR. Notice if you combine this with itself, 
You get there because our coset representative here is the identity. We generally don't write that. So the identity times the identity is the identity. Here we get the coset SR. Here we get the coset SR. Here we get the coset S squared R. But again, S squared R is the identity. So now comparing that to the Cayley table for Z2, we have 0, 1, 0, 1. Notice we get the same sort of structure for that Cayley table, so that gives us motivation for this isomorphism, and we can define this isomorphism in the following way. We have this coset is sent to zero, and then this coset is sent to one. Okay, good. So that's a good place to finish this example and the video.